it's an honor to me to introduce you to Dr. Professor Dan Kuritsky from Harvard University. He has been working on HIV cure for quite some time. He was a pioneer in, in, in observations in patients who received bone marrow transplants and uh, were able to control for several months the HIV replication. And uh, uh, he's continuously contributing to understanding on how to develop new strategies to uh, control virus replication and virus eradication. Dan, thank you, thank you again. It's a pleasure to have you here once again in Brazil. And I hope this is a, uh, a dot in your year schedule from now to come. Thank you. Muito obrigado. É um grande prazer para mim falar aqui hoje. Uh, you fala so um pouquinho de português. That about exhausts my knowledge of Portuguese, so I'll have to give the rest of my talk in English. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to give you a, a rapid uh, review of where we stand with the uh, now two and possibly three cases of cure and how they differ from the experience that we had with our Boston patients and the Mississippi baby and, and a patient in San Francisco. And then I'll talk to you about uh, an ongoing study from which we have some preliminary results a very early initiation of treatment in uh, newborns who are diagnosed at the time of birth as having been infected, and that is work being done in collaboration with Roger Shapiro and Matthias Lichtefeld uh, in uh, uh, Botswana. Uh, these are my disclosures. So, uh, the, uh, I, as I said, I'll first speak about uh, the association between uh, reservoir size and uh, time to viral rebound, and then talk about the reservoir in HIV-infected infants uh, who uh, receive immediate art after birth and a little bit about where we're going next with that uh, cohort. So before uh, launching into the uh, uh, main talk, let me just uh, provide some definitions of, of cure. And when we talk about eradicating HIV, I think what we really mean is the elimination of all de detectable virus from blood and uh, tissue reservoirs so that there's no virus present that could lead to uh, renewal of infection or transmission of infection to, to other people. Functional cure, by contrast, uh, means that there's no detectable virus in the blood or tissues in the absence of treatment, uh, but there might still be virus present someplace where we can't sample. And that's probably true in any situation where we think we've cured uh, a patient. Uh, certainly the case in cancer where we think we've cured people of lymphoma or of breast cancer. We can't be absolutely certain because we can't sample the entire body. And then there's the situation of durable treatment-free remission where there's no plasmaviremia, no transmissible virus in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. Uh, but there might still be detectable virus in, the, um, uh, in some reservoir cells. Uh, when uh, 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 Susana Val uh, Valente speaks about uh, uh, permanent suppression of virus, that would be one example of how you might have persisting uh, virus without uh, actual uh, infection. Um, but how long this would be and how long it would need to be in order for it to be clinically uh, reasonable is, is still the subject of great debate. So, of course, the, we used to say the only case so far of cure is that of Timothy Ray Brown, who will be here tomorrow afternoon, and the, the so-called Berlin patient. But now he's one of two known cured patients, and the, so he's now the first patient to be cured of HIV. And the uh, situation was uh, that he had a uh, long-standing HIV infection for which he was receiving uh, antiretroviral therapy, does that show up there? No, uh, no, it doesn't. Okay. Um, and uh, he then developed uh, acute leukemia, went off therapy to receive chemotherapy for his uh, uh, leukemia, uh, was then uh, placed back on therapy, had a relapse of his leukemia, and so he underwent a stem cell transplant. And the key issue here in his transplant was that uh, his uh, hematologist, Gero Hutta, had the foresight to f identify a donor who had a, a good HLA match who also happened to be homozygous for the uh, deletion in CCR5 so that the donor cells lacked any CCR5 and were resistant to infection with R5 virus. 
And so from the time of transplantation, whoops, uh, of, uh, here, from the time of transplantation, there was no longer any detectable plasma viremia, even though uh, he had gone off therapy. He actually had a, a relapse of his leukemia about a, a year later, uh, but they were able to go back to the same donor uh, who, uh, with the CCR5 deleted uh, cell, stem cells and repeat the stem cell transplant. This time the transplant cured uh, Mr. Brown of his, H of his um, leukemia and also permanently cured him of uh, HIV. And it's now been a decade since the uh, paper was published and more than a decade since uh, uh, the time of his transplant. And I'm sure you'll hear more details about that uh, tomorrow. Now, we had a pair of patients, and I'll, for the sake of time, just talk about one patient uh, who had uh, lymphoma uh, and had undergone many rounds of treatment for lymphoma, including previous auto transplants, but uh, had again relapsed lymphoma or secondary lymphomas that uh, arose and came to allogeneic stem cell transplant. In this case, the patients received cells from a wild-type donor, uh, but in contrast to the situation with Mr. Brown, and contrary to what had been standard of care in the United States at the time, these patients continued on their antiretroviral therapy throughout the transplant period. Uh, that was possible largely because of newer drugs that had fewer drug-drug interactions with both the chemotherapy given as the conditioning regimen and with the immunosuppressive therapy given uh, uh, around the time of transplant in order to minimize graft-versus-host disease. And what you can see for uh, this patient, whom we call patient B, that just prior to the transplant, he had a, a, a proviral DNA load of about 100 copies per a million um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Uh, that bumped up slightly uh, uh, after the transplant. That's probably within error. But then as uh, the, the patient became fully uh, uh, chimeric, meaning all of their uh, white blood cells were now of donor origin, so no longer any circulating cells from the host, well, we could no longer detect uh, any proviral DNA, and that uh, continued out to uh, uh, about uh, two years. Remember, this patient is still on antiretroviral therapy at the time. But we did exhaustive sampling with very large volume blood draws, a, a leukophoresis to be able to do viral outgrowth assays and to uh, uh, try to detect uh, HIV DNA by PCR with very sensitive assays in large numbers of cells and many replicate assays and even a rectal biopsy and all of those were negative so we decided cautiously uh, to do a treatment interruption and to follow the patient every week with uh, HIV plasma RNAs to see if they might relapse and initially we were doing them every week and then we started spacing the tests out to every uh, other week uh, and you can see that he was persistently uh, uh, below detection uh, with uh, plasma viremia, and he was below detection with uh, 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 proviral DNA. Well, that all went fine until about 200 days, and then uh, he had come in for a visit, had a virus load done, and a few days later called to complain that he was having fever, muscle aches and pains, a little bit of a headache and stiff neck. So we said, well, please go get another virus load done, and what happened was he had rebounded. But he had gone for 200 days, and during those 200 days, there was only uh, decreasing levels of uh, antibody that was detectable. There were no detectable uh, CD4 or CD8 T cell responses directed against the virus. Now, when he did rebound, because his uh, new immune system was completely naive to HIV, he uh, resembled primary infection with very rapid increase in virus load to nearly a million copies. Uh, he had a headache, as I described, and had some uh, about 300 copies of virus in the s spinal fluid, but was able to be rapidly resuppressed on a dolutegravir-containing regimen. And you can see here his proviral DNAs were consistently negative off of antiretroviral therapy until his relapse, and then uh, he has um, a measurable uh, uh, provirus, uh, and then that decreases again once he's on, on therapy. Now, a case that is more similar to the uh, Berlin patient, but one where uh, there was failure despite the uh, transplant of CCR5 uh, uh, deleted cells is the Essen patient. And more information about this patient was presented uh, by uh, Monique Nyhaus uh, uh, at the uh, Amsterdam conference this past summer. So this person had been on antiretroviral therapy. Uh, had some uh, residual viremia, and the green circles here represent the uh, 
uh, proportion of virus that was R5, so CCR5 using. And the size of the circle represents the proportion of the population. Uh, so you can see that here, and this is actually uh, information that was obtained in retrospect, there's a mixture of R5 and X4 viruses, viruses that use the alternative co-receptor for entry, CXCR4. And so when this person underwent a stem cell transplant with CCR5 deleted donor cells, became fully chimeric with the uh, donor uh, lymphocytes, and then a, a month later, antiretroviral therapy was stopped, there was prompt rebound of the virus because the virus that was present uh, could use the alternative co-receptor. And all you see here now is a pure population of X4 virus. So um, uh, the, uh, the green or R5 virus is unable to replicate in the new donors, uh, uh, in the new lymphocytes uh, that, that come from the donor, but the, the donor cells are perfectly able to support the replication of CXCR4 using virus. And so um, uh, while our patients show that uh, uh, reducing the reservoir may prolong time to relapse, it's certainly not sufficient to achieve long-term cure. Uh, you also have to have cells that are resistant uh, to uh, HIV infection or some means of controlling uh, viral replication uh, beyond re reduction of the reservoir, but uh, knocking out CCR5 may not be sufficient if you have the wrong kind of virus. And then, uh, I won't go through all the details here, but this is a patient that uh, Tim Henrich, who was the uh, a postdoctoral fellow in our lab when uh, the Boston patients were described, but then moved to San Francisco, where he's now an associate professor. Uh, and he uh, uh, had identified a patient who was coming in for PrEP, who at the initial visit was uh, HIV negative, but then uh, had a, at the, on the day that he actually started PrEP, had just a couple of hundred copies of HIV RNA. So had just become infected in, in the time between his first uh, pre-PrEP visit and the, the day that he starts. And so they started him immediately on a five-drug regimen, rapidly suppressed his uh, HIV RNA, and then uh, followed him out for uh, two years. And what all the small print that you can't read describes are the many different tests that they did, which included uh, lymph node biopsies and spinal tap and uh, lots of uh, attempts to grow virus and to uh, detect virus by PCR. Uh, all of these were negative. And because this person was treated within days of infection, uh, there was also no measurable HIV-specific immune response of any kind. The patient did not seroconvert and did not develop uh, uh, um, uh, adaptive immunity, uh, T-cell-mediated immunity. So they also decided to do a treatment interruption. And uh, this patient had a course that was almost exactly like that of the of Boston patient B. For a little more than 200 days, about 225 days here, the patient remained completely without any relapse and then rebounds uh, rapidly, having a recapitulation of primary infection because his initial primary infection was aborted with the immediate initiation of treatment. And here he's able to uh, recapitulate, uh, or have a, a full-blown primary infection with a virus load that goes up uh, to um, uh, more than uh, uh, a million copies. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it goes up to about 100,000 copies. Uh, and then rapidly suppresses on, on antiretroviral therapy. And then the last of these uh, cases, or second to last of these cases of uh, long-term remission uh, are, is the Mississippi baby, uh, a baby who was uh, born of a mother who had not had appropriate uh, antenatal care, was not on antiretroviral therapy until the time of delivery. The baby uh, was identified rapidly as having been infected, placed on antiretroviral therapy that suppressed uh, the virus uh, quickly, but then, and after a period of time, was lost to follow-up and was um, picked up again uh, in care several years later, uh, at which point the baby had not been on any antiretroviral therapy uh, for a couple of years and appeared to have no detectable virus. And just like the Boston patients uh, and the San Francisco patient had no viremia and no detectable provirus uh, in their cells. There were fewer assays that could be done because on this child than we could do in an adult, but uh, that was the same, uh, the same idea. However, uh, eventually this baby uh, also relapsed, uh, as you can see uh, uh, here after, uh, at, at about four years of age. 
And then the, uh, this is the last of the, um, the long-term suppression uh, cases. Uh, here, um, this is a baby who had been enrolled uh, in, uh, uh, in the SHARE uh, study, and th this person uh, started treatment uh, early in life and then uh, uh, was suppressed for many years. Uh, uh, well, for about a year, I should say, and then uh, has been off therapy and now uh, out to 10 years appears to have no rebound. Whether this person, baby is actually cured or not is hard to say because virologic studies that have been done show that there is actually detectable uh, a signal. It's just that there's no virus uh, in the cells. There's just no virus that's uh, actually replicating uh, in, in this baby. So that brings me then to the London patient. And the London patient shares similarities with the Boston patient and the Berlin patient. Like the Boston patients, this person had been um, diagnosed uh, uh, many years earlier, had uh, not been on antiretroviral therapy for the first uh, uh, seven or 10 years or, or so of infection. Uh, then uh, after going a few years after starting antiretroviral therapy, developed lymphoma, uh, went through multiple rounds of treatment for his lymphoma and eventually came to uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant. Uh, th this was a nine out of 10 HLA match at, from a donor who was uh, homozygous for the CCR5 uh, Delta 32 uh, uh, mutation. So uh, like the Berlin patient received um, uh, cells that are resistant to HIV, but like the Boston patients received a reduced intensity uh, conditioning regimen. So, uh, and the point of emphasizing that is the, the chemotherapy itself is really doing little or nothing to reduce the reservoir. What happens is after the uh, stem cell transplantation, when the pa patient becomes fully chimeric, because now all of the circulating cells uh, and presumably uh, all or nearly all of the cells in the tissues are of, of donor origin, um, that there's graft versus host reaction, which is killing off the host cells. Some of those host cells happen to have HIV in them, and as bystanders, essentially, because there's no HIV-specific immunity in these donated cells, but the, the HIV-containing cells are being killed off, and that leads to this reduction in the uh, reservoir. Here, these, uh, uh, li this doesn't mean there's still detectable virus. It's just that uh, this is the limit of detection of, of their assay. And so now um, uh, the um, London patient had stopped uh, antiretroviral therapy about two years after their uh, transplant and is 18 months after uh, uh, stopping therapy without any evidence of viral rebound. Um, most likely, this represents a cure. Uh, it's a little early to say for sure. Uh, looking back at all previous samples, uh, uh, Ravi Gupta and the team that have uh, been following uh, this patient have been able to show that he had only R5 virus, so uh, hopefully there isn't any X4 virus hiding in the tissues that might rebound, but I don't think we'll know for sure until there's several more years of follow-up. And then we heard also uh, at, uh, the, the, uh, at Croy last month that um, a patient in Dusseldorf has a similar uh, experience, except is only four months after having stopped therapy uh, and may represent a third possible uh, case of HIV cure. Again, a, a patient with a, a hematologic malignancy who underwent stem cell transplantation uh, with uh, uh, donor cells that are um, missing CCR5. So what have we learned from these experiences? Well, it's clearly possible to reduce substantially uh, the reservoir of latent virus. In the setting of an allogeneic stem cell transplant, this reduction most likely is mediated by immunological mechanisms, namely graft versus host reaction. And I'm, now that we see the, uh, the same pattern in the uh, London patient as in the Berlin patient and in the two Boston patients, uh, I, I think it's really pr uh, pretty consistent that it's the GVH, not the chemotherapy, that is reducing the, uh, the reservoir. Uh, th this reduction prolongs the time to viral rebound, as in the case of the, the Boston patients, and, but it also tells us that latency can be maintained in the absence of measurable HIV-specific uh, cellular immunity. You don't need T cells to keep the virus in check. That doesn't mean to say that they can't keep the virus in check, but you can have pure virologic latency uh, absent any uh, measurable cellular immune response. 
The vir but it also shows us in the failure cases, the San Francisco patient, the Mississippi baby, and the two Boston patients, that virus persists in reservoirs that are inaccessible to clinical sampling, and that reactivation of even rare latently infected cells uh, is sufficient to cause virologic relapse. And the Essen patient teaches us that minority X4 variants can lead to relapse in the context of a homozygous CCR5 deletion. So I want to digress for a moment to talk about some very interesting work that's been done uh, in macaques because I think it helps us understand uh, and place into context these, uh, the issues of what role does virus load play and what role does uh, uh, cellular immune response play in um, uh, time to uh, virus rebound and, uh, and the extent of virus rebound. So we know from the work of James Whitney and Dan Baruch that if you infect macaques and then start them immediately on uh, antiretroviral therapy or at different times after infection that the size of the reservoir uh, uh, increases with the delay in initiation of treatment. So uh, these monkeys are controls that did not get treatment. Uh, these monkeys were treated three days after infection, seven days after infection, uh, and so on. And when you stop therapy, uh, eventually, so they let the monkeys get virologically suppressed, and then they stop the therapy, and what you see is all the monkeys rebound, even the monkeys that were treated within three days of infection uh, have virologic rebound. But here, the, the rebound uh, takes a longer time than for the monkeys that were treated later. Um, it's, it, the scale makes it a little hard to, to appreciate that, but these monkeys are um, uh, going out for um, uh, uh, 20 to 30 days before they rebound, and these monkeys are rebounding really quite, uh, quite early. And then uh, Afa Mokoye at the, uh, the Oregon uh, Primate Center uh, has done a really very interesting experiment where he took uh, macaques that he infected with uh, uh, a, a strain of SIV, uh, placed them on therapy shortly after infection, allowed the monkeys to become fully suppressed, and then gave repeated uh, infusions of an anti-CD8 antibody in order to eliminate the, uh, the cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes uh, and during that time uh, had the uh, interrupted antiretroviral therapy to see if there would be virologic rebound. And what they observed was really quite striking. Uh, there was absolutely no difference in the time to virologic rebound in the monkeys who had their CD8 T cells depleted compared to the monkeys that uh, received a control uh, immunoglobulin. And there was no difference in the um, rate of reactivation of, the, of these latent uh, in infected cells. However, when they let the monkeys get to viral set point, what they found is that the set point was much higher in the monkeys with the uh, CD8 depletion compared to the control monkeys that uh, retained their virus-specific you know, CD8 T cells. And I think that, uh, together with some modeling that Allison Hill did based on, uh, on the Boston patients and other uh, patients, suggests that the more you reduce virus load, uh, not, not virus load, the more you reduce the reservoir, the longer the time to virologic rebound. Uh, and it's really the size of the reservoir that is governing rebound, not the uh, uh, immune response uh, to, uh, to the virus. But what it what we also see is that even a thousand-fold, a three-log reduction uh, in uh, the reservoir means that you have a 50% chance of relapsing within three years. You would need to achieve a uh, four- or five-log reduction uh, to be able to have some certainty that you could go out for uh, decades before experiencing rebound or uh, actually having a cure. So the implications of, uh, of all of this uh, work so far is that it seems that reservoir size is really the determining factor in time to, to viral rebound. And that uh, CD8 positive T cells do not appear to alter uh, the timing or the kinetics of viral rebound, but limit the extent of rebound. Approaches aimed solely at enhancing uh, HIV-specific T cell responses then uh, w might be unlikely to prevent viral rebound, 
uh, but uh, enhanced uh, HIV-specific immunity may be important for containing viral rebound uh, in the setting of a reduced reservoir. So if the Boston patients had a reduced reservoir but then had some therapy that would also have augmented HIV-specific immunity, it might have been possible to contain the rebound if it occurred uh, and to con contain it sufficiently so that the patients would essentially have a functional cure even if they weren't truly cured. So let me turn now to the study that we are doing in, um, uh, in Botswana, the Moselle Wapula study, or early infant treatment study. And this is a, a clinical uh, treatment trial uh, in HIV-infected uh, babies in, uh, in Botswana. So first, as uh, you saw from the work of James Whitney and McCax, a very similar data uh, over much longer time uh, scale uh, has been collected by Deb Prasad uh, looking at the uh, uh, reservoir size here measured crudely by just HIV DNA PCR uh, in infants who started treatment uh, within the first year of life, those who started uh, treatment during the first five years of life, and those who started after five years of age. And so you can see that the uh, early treated infants had a much smaller uh, reservoir. Now, HIV is transmitted from mother to child at, at three different, can be transmitted at three different times uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the um, uh, gestational period, there can be in utero transmission, and the, the trans, route of transmission there is presumably transplacental, and the, the way we determine that in utero transmission has occurred is that at birth, the baby will be HIV DNA and RNA positive. There can be peripartum transmission, transmission during birth, and that is uh, generally believed to be transmission that occurs through oral or, or mucosal routes because the baby uh, swallows or aspirates maternal blood at the time of delivery. And those babies are HIV, DNA, and RNA negative at birth, but become positive at, uh, by one month of life. And then there's postpartum infection, which is generally uh, uh, occurring due to, uh, due to breastfeeding. So again, it's uh, oral and mucosal uh, transmission. And these babies are HIV, DNA, and RNA negative at birth and at one month, but then become positive at later time points. And of course, we rely here on nucleic acid testing because all of the babies are uh, seropositive since they have passively acquired HIV antibodies from the, from the mother. So in our study, which is a single-arm, non-randomized trial of early, uh, very early treatment in uh, uh, babies who had uh, antepartum, that is, uh, before birth, and peripartum infection, uh, we looked at children who were HIV positive within seven days of life uh, if, uh, and defined those as have, having had anti, antepartum infection, uh, in utero infection, or they were, uh, became infected by day 57, uh, which we defined as peripartum infection. And we began by uh, enrolling babies in uh, Haberone and Francistown regions of Botswana with the intention of enrolling up to 30 babies in the antepartum cohort and 20 in the peripartum co cohort, and then 20 controls, that is, uh, uh, babies who were on uh, antiretroviral therapy that had been started in the first year of life, but beyond uh, the two uh, uh, sets of criteria for uh, in utero or peripartum transmission. And then uh, the, with the intent of following these uh, children for uh, 96 to 192 weeks, uh, we began uh, initially with a nivirapine zidovudine 3TC regimen until two weeks of age after which the babies switched to a boosted lopinavir, which was, the, uh, when we started the study, the uh, uh, standard regimen for uh, infant treatment in Botswana. Uh, the objectives of the study are to d demonstrate that, first of all, that antiretroviral therapy can be safely initiated very early in life uh, after diagnosis of antepartum or peripartum infection and will result in rapid viral decay in the majority of infants, and then to evaluate virologic and immunologic outcomes uh, in uh, infancy within the uh, prospective cohorts and with uh, infants who were infected uh, postpartum as a comparison group. So we opened screening in uh, April of 2015 uh, in Haberone and then in uh, Francistown uh, a few months later uh, and enrolled uh, participant uh, clinic visits. Uh, uh, all, all the visits occurred uh, uh, in these uh, areas and then we eventually expanded the um, uh, uh, catchment area to include uh, maternal health clinics in uh, not only in uh, uh, Haberone but also in Molepolole, Mochudi, and uh, Celebi Pikwe. 
Uh, and these additional screening sites uh, were uh, added in uh, September of 2016, as well as smaller uh, delivery sites in the outskirts of the two major cities. And you can see uh, uh, where they are he uh, here. This is uh, Haverone, and then Francis Town is, is up there. So this was actually an extraordinary undertaking, and I can't uh, thank Roger Shapiro and his, uh, our colleagues in uh, Botswana enough. 10, 000, nearly 10,000 newborns uh, were, were screened. 9,075 newborns were screened in a, in a three-year period. This represented nearly 30% of all HIV-exposed infants in Botswana uh, during that time period. From that, we identified 42 babies that were HIV positive, 20 that were indeterminate. Uh, there were two false positives that were subsequently shown to be negative, and 20 indeterminates that we eventually determined were really negative. And so that left us with 40 uh, uh, infants whom we enrolled. Uh, that uh, translates to a, a mother-to-child transmission rate of 0.4%, which is a really a, a, an incredible um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, acknowledgement of how effective the um, uh, maternal health campaign is in Botswana for preventing uh, HIV transmission. These women were all late presenters who started on antiretroviral therapy uh, in the, the third trimester or very close to delivery. So 32 uh, children were eligible to be enrolled in, the, um, uh, in, in our uh, prospective uh, treatment cohort. Uh, 11 had uh, more than 84 weeks of follow-up and are the data that I'll show you. Uh, there are another 20 children that are still in follow-up. Uh, we had one death due to infant uh, uh, diarrhea and then we are uh, con continuing to enroll additional children uh, through this time. So here uh, you can see that uh, these kids uh, uh, did uh, suppress viremia. Uh, the green uh, are all below 40 copies, which was the limit of detection of the assay, and the orange are all detectable. There were occasional uh, periods of uh, non-adherence where there was virologic rebound, but then resuppression when the babies resumed therapy, and sometimes there were late uh, episodes of, of non-adherence. This one baby uh, uh, took a longer time to, uh, to suppress. There was no correlation between the um, level of uh, plasma HIV RNA or DNA at the time of birth and the, uh, uh, the level of uh, PBMC-associated DNA uh, at 84 weeks. You can see uh, this baby who had the highest uh, viremia, uh, 10 million copies and uh, nearly 2,000 uh, copy, uh, proviral copies per uh, million cells uh, had uh, very low uh, DNA reservoir when measured at week uh, 84. And conversely, uh, um, uh, this baby here, who had a moderately uh, size, lo moderate level of viremia and a relatively smaller proviral DNA level, had uh, modest uh, provirus uh, level uh, at week 84 as well. The babies who m suppressed viremia and who uh, stayed suppressed then uh, eventually became seronegative because they uh, never made any of their own antibody against HIV. Their maternal antibody was cleared, but because the, uh, they had rapid clearance of viral antigen by the uh, initiation of antiretroviral therapy before their own adaptive immune response had a chance to develop, uh, these babies uh, were uh, negative uh, by, um, those babies that were DNA negative were for the most part ELISA negative, all but one. Uh, and then the babies that were positive, of course, uh, became uh, seropositive over time. So their own antibody, not maternal antibody any longer. So from this first part, we can conclude that the children treated in the first week of life had a low viral reservoirs at enrollment and after 84 weeks of treatment, uh, that after 84 weeks of treatment, uh, consistent viral suppression was associated with reversion to negative uh, qualitative DNA PCR and negative uh, ELISAs. And simple tests such as a qualitative DNA PCR and ELISA may serve as good markers for a very small reservoir size uh, in children who are treated immediately uh, after birth. So we then went on to do a more uh, detailed analysis of the reservoir, looking at uh, cell-associated HIV uh, uh, DNA by uh, 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 digital droplet PCR and then doing near full-length uh, proviral genome analysis uh, after single genome amplification where the, uh, we had done limiting dilution of the pr uh, peripheral blo 
blood mononuclear cells so that uh, any positive well uh, represented a, a positive uh, amplicon from just one uh, provirus. Uh, the, the sequences were aligned and then classified as being intact or defective based on the presence or absence of defects in the five prime uh, LTR, whether they were hypermutated, had premature stop codons, inversions, or, or large deletions. Uh, we uh, ended up with uh, 381 uh, full length sequences, 125 of which were intact, and 256 were defective. Uh, we also uh, explored the decrease of intact and defective sequences over time and fitted that to an exponential decay um, uh, in order to uh, uh, compare the rates of decay using nonlinear uh, least squares methods uh, and compared um, these infants to uh, infants who had been treated later during the first year of life, our control group, as well as to adults treated either during acute or chronic uh, HIV infection. So what you can see here is the uh, reduction in uh, plasma HIV RNA over time. Uh, you saw that in the table before, but this is showing the individual uh, infants and the, the decay slope. And then here, the uh, decrease in cell-associated uh, DNA. And so going from the time of birth to uh, weeks uh, 84 or 96, uh, you can see that there has been a significant decrease and that these babies have a significantly lower uh, amount of uh, cell-associated HIV DNA uh, compared to uh, babies treated uh, uh, later in uh, infancy. Also, uh, this group has a lower uh, burden of uh, proviral DNA uh, compared to uh, adults who are treated, uh, I'm sorry, compared to the control infants, but also compared to adults on antiretroviral therapy who are treated during chronic infection or uh, treated during acute HIV infection. Then when we look at the um, full-length uh, sequences, here the um, these pink uh, sequences are intact sequences, and then the green and, and white ones uh, are sequences that, uh, and unfortunately, the, there are bars that end here uh, that represent uh, deletions, but are, don't really project very well uh, 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 on the screen. Uh, so you can see that there are a number of uh, babies that have uh, uh, intact sequences, and, um, uh, but there are quite a few that are defective, as we see uh, in, uh, in adults. And then these are, uh, in the control uh, infants, those treated later in life, there are many fewer intact sequences. The vast majority of these sequences uh, are defective. When we look at the rate of decay uh, of the uh, defective and intact sequences, uh, we found something uh, interesting here where the red bars show the sequences that are uh, intact and the, um, uh, the uh, blue or aqua colored bars are the defective sequences and there seems to be a, a, a faster decay of the intact uh, proviruses compared to the defective proviruses. Uh, that is uh, seen more clearly on this slide where we actually modeled the decay rate and the half-life for the intact proviruses was um, three and a half uh, uh, weeks as opposed to 4.4 weeks for the, for the defectives, and that was uh, statistically significant. We also examined the clonality of these sequences, and here I have to say this is really a um, superficial look at clonality because we're just looking at sequence identity. Uh, we didn't have enough cells in most of the babies to actually do integration site analysis, which is what's required to prove uh, clonal origin. Uh, and you can see that uh, here the uh, stippled uh, bars represent ident uh, when there's more than one sequence of the same, uh, the proportion of sequences that uh, uh, were uh, multiple sequences. So uh, in other words, about 50% of the uh, intact sequence, 50% of all sequences in this baby were intact and were single. Uh, about five or 7% uh, represented uh, multiple sequences and were intact, and then these were the defectives. If we look just at the intact sequences, you can see that 90% in this baby were uh, single sequences and about 10% uh, represented uh, uh, duplicate or multiple uh, replicate uh, sequences, so suggesting a clonal expansion. And uh, in uh, these uh, 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 people who've been on antiretroviral therapy for many years, you see there's a larger proportion of clonally expanded uh, sequences. <laughs> 
There were also uh, some immunological differences. I won't speak at l length about these, partly because of time and because uh, th this work is still ongoing, and uh, Xu Yu has been uh, doing these analyses for us at the Reagan uh, Institute. But there were uh, interesting associations with different uh, NK uh, uh, subsets, some uh, uh, where there were uh, uh, negative correlations, so that higher proviral loads were associated with uh, an increased number of NKP30 positive cells or with uh, 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 whether you were looking at the entire NK population or, or the uh, subset. Uh, these are the um, uh, CD56 uh, positive, CD16 negative, I believe. The, the print is tiny even on the screen here. But there were uh, uh, positive correlations with the CD161 positive NK cells and positive correlations with the uh, NKG2D positive uh, NK cells and reservoir size. Uh, similarly, there were different associations uh, of reservoir size with uh, different monocyte uh, subpopulations, whether looking at classical monocytes, intermediate monocytes, or non-classical uh, monocytes. So the conclusions from the second part are that uh, early initiation of uh, antiretroviral therapy in HIV-infected neonates uh, significantly limited establishment of the reservoir of uh, PBMCs harboring intact proviruses that cells harboring intact proviruses seem to decay more rapidly than cells harboring defective proviruses. There were distinctive correlations of different NK cell and monocyte populations with the intact viral reservoir, suggesting a role for NK cell responses in shaping and structuring the viral reservoir in the developing neonatal immune system. And these data provide strong empiric evidence supporting the immediate initiation of antiretroviral therapy uh, for HIV-infected neonates. So where do we go next? Um, when we first designed the study, we thought that we would treat these kids for a couple of years and then stop therapy and see uh, what happened. But then the Mississippi baby rebounded, and that didn't seem like such a good idea any longer. So uh, we would like to provide some additional intervention to these children in, in order to be able to uh, uh, enhance the likelihood of them remaining suppressed. However, finding suitable interventions that can be used in very young children is a real challenge. Uh, we certainly can't give them latency reactivating agents like a histone deacetylase inhibitor. Those are drugs we use to treat cancer, and it's hard enough to get permission to use them in uh, healthy HIV-infected adults. Nobody is going to let us do that in children, nor would it make a lot of sense. It would be really terrific to try to give a therapeutic vaccine uh, to these kids, but there are really not good candidate vaccines available that can be used uh, in, um, in very young children. Uh, Checkpoint inhibitors are being studied in adults uh, with great caution, but nobody has any enthusiasm for doing that in young children. And similarly, uh, we're not about to start doing gene editing on a, a mature or stem cell uh, of the, from these kids and reinfusing them uh, to give them, say, uh, CCR5 modified cells of their own. So that left us with the opportunity of uh, trying broadly neutralizing antibodies. And uh, uh, in collaboration with Lucio Gama and uh, Rick Kaup and others from the, the RC, as well as uh, uh, Marina Kasky and Michelle Nussensweig from the Rockefeller, uh, we hit on a dual BNAB regimen uh, that we're going to be able to give these children in the Tatello study, uh, which is just about ready to start. Uh, this is a clinical trial to evaluate the impact of broadly neutralizing antibodies, VRCO1 LS, the long-acting form, and 101074, uh, and whether we're able to maintain viral suppression after uh, stopping antiretroviral therapy uh, in these uh, babies. And we're going to enroll up to 35 uh, of these children who have uh, received very early treatment uh, through the initial study and who have had at least two years of uh, follow-up. Uh, the objectives will be to determine the safety and pharmacokinetics and antiviral efficacy of up to a six-month uh, in, uh, uh, interruption of small molecule therapy during which they will be getting uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies in this uh, early treated uh, cohort of children in, in, uh, in Botswana. And to evaluate the effects of treatment with these uh, two antibodies on the size and cellular composition of the residual viral reservoir to investigate the influence of these antibodies uh, on the magnitude and quality of antiviral uh, innate and adaptive immune responses, uh, particularly if any of the babies uh, should uh, relapse. Um, I won't go through uh, the 
study design in detail, just we have a lead cohort to get some PK data and then we'll uh, enroll uh, additional uh, participants and then after they've uh, been on uh, treatment for a period of time, we'll then stop their uh, small molecule therapy, continue them for 24 weeks on the antibodies and then we'll resume uh, antiretroviral therapy after 24 weeks and, and, and continue to follow the babies thereafter. So let me stop there. I want to acknowledge a, a huge group of uh, people who uh, helped uh, with all of this work, uh, particularly uh, Tim Henrich for the work on the Boston patients, uh, and then Matthias Lichtefeld, uh, Roger Shapiro, and Xu Yu for the work in the Totello study, along with our uh, uh, partners at the Botswana Harvard AIDS Partnership, uh, particularly uh, Sikulele Moyo and um, uh, Ajibola Gbolalahan, who've been really very helpful uh, in this work. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you, Dan. Great talk, and I would like to open for questions from the audience or through the, the app. You can uh, send the questions over. Rick. So, Dan, have you uh, looked at uh, transmitted founder uh, viruses within the Botswana maternal fetal uh, cohort and uh, determined their sensitivity to the uh, BRCA1 and 101074.: 10, 10, uh, We are in the midst of doing single genome sequencing of uh, envelope, proviral uh, envelope sequences for the, uh, for the babies. Yes. We have the, the sequences on the first two babies I uh, just saw on Tuesday, so we're, we're getting those. That, it does raise a very tricky question um, because we're obviously not doing this as a CLIA lab, um, but if we did encounter a resistance mutation, it would be hard to want to go ahead and give those babies antibodies and no treatment. Yeah. Mike. And I was, I was wondering if you could expand a little more on why you think that graft versus host is so important in suppressing virus in, in, the, in your lymphoma patients, for example, um, and why it's not just a delayed stochastic reawakening of a very rare, a very rare uh, um, integrated competent virus. Oh, I, I think both of those statements are, are true. Uh, I, I think. The baby, the, the, babies, the, the patients relapsed because there was the stochastic activation of a rare, persisting, uh, uh, lately infected cell. But the reason that the cells were so rare is because their number had been dramatically reduced, and it wasn't reduced by the chemotherapy. Remember, patient B had uh, had had um, multiple rounds of chemotherapy for his initial lymphoma had had an, aut an autologous stem cell transplant, and then had uh, additional rounds of chemotherapy when he uh, developed his uh, second lymphoma. And despite all of that, he still had 100 copies per million PBMCs of proviral DNA, and then received a reduced intensity conditioning regimen. We know from other work that we've done that during the immediate chemotherapy period, there's a, an initial transient reduction, but then as counts recover, the the proviral DNA level comes right back to normal. So something was eliminating those cells. And, and what the, we think the something was graft-versus-host reaction. Uh, and it was true in both of our patients, and we think it, it also accounts for uh, the reduction in the reservoir in the London patient, who did not get ablative chemotherapy. Right? Uh, the Berlin patient received ablative chemotherapy and total body irradiation. Uh, as preparation for the stem cell transplant, largely because he had AML, and so he needed more aggressive therapy. Uh, but the London patient had only had only only had lymphoma, and so they didn't need such uh, intense chemo uh, in order to undergo this stem cell transplant. But the uh, the coincidence of the chimerism uh, and um, the uh, becoming uh, complete, and then the total loss of proviral DNA signal. It's not. It's not simply a dilution effect, uh, uh, because um, because we really sampled exhaustively. I mean, with phoresis of you know tens of millions of uh, of T cells, and you and we couldn't find any that that. But they persist. 
uh, they just persist in places you can't find them. I'm sure that in both Timothy Ray Brown and in, uh, and in the London patient, there are persisting uh, host cells, uh, but in, because they also have cells that are now resistant, the rare uh, reactivation events uh, don't have an opportunity to be propagated. Hi, Dan. Thank you very much. Very inspiring, very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, talk. Um, there's been about 50 cases of, of 50 experiments, let's say, about uh, uh, transplantation, uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation, using uh, homozygous CCR5 delta 32, right, uh, donor uh, mm -hmm. cells. And yet we, we do have so far two, perhaps three, uh, cases of cure. Um, you mentioned one case w which was related to, uh, one failure which was related to uh, uh, co-receptor usage and, and the development of CXR4 uh, using viruses, but um, would you speculate on additional factors that could, you know, explain those, all those fa failures um, uh, in terms of yeah. only two successful cases? Sh sure. Um, well, I, th I think, unfortunately, the most common cause of failure is death from the underlying malignancy. Uh, that they, either the transplant itself is unsuccessful or, or there's late relapse uh, uh, of the le leukemia or lymphoma. Uh, so um, uh, after the Essen patient, but before, many years before the London patient, uh, uh, Gero Hutter had a follow-up letter in the New England Journal of Medicine where at the time he described about 10 cases or so, uh, one of which was the, his successful case and then several others. And, and the, the others had all died uh, of their uh, underlying disease or of complications from the stem cell transplant. There had been some concern for a period that maybe doing transplants with CCR5 deleted cells was a bad idea, but I don't think that's really held up. And there are now several other patients who've been transplanted who are still on antiretroviral therapy. So they, they sort of look like the Boston patients at this point, no detectable virus, but uh, on therapy, so you can't say for sure. That was the case with the, the um, uh, Dusseldorf patient until a couple of months ago when they decided to go ahead and stop uh, treatment. So, um, you know, it, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's really Monique Nyhaus and uh, Anna-Marie Vensing and Javier martinez Picado through the EC STEM uh, co uh, collaboration that are uh, gathering data worldwide on all of these patients and trying to, uh, to collate the information. Well, I have one question here through the app. It says, why do you think we can reduce reservoir in babies if treated very quickly after infection? And in adults, it doesn't seem to happen. Um, th that's a great question. So the one advantage we have in babies is uh, we know exactly when they're born. We don't know precisely when they're infected because we, we, there are data that suggest that most in utero transmission occurs very late in pregnancy, um, but um, uh, whether these babies were infected uh, two days before or two weeks before or even four weeks before the birth is, is, is hard to know. But, they're, um, uh, but most of them are being infected at around the time, uh, shortly before birth. Whereas in adults, uh, except for patients like the San Francisco patient that I showed you, uh, we generally, uh, by the time we know that they're infected, they already have this very, very high virus load. Uh, and the earliest that we get people, on, except those in active screening programs where they're being monitored every other week, uh, I'm sorry, a, a couple of times a week, like in the Thai military cohort, uh, it's really very hard. In, the, in that cohort in Thailand, when they uh, did identify people within days of infection, they were able to get similar reductions uh, in uh, in in the reservoir. The problem is when you have somebody with early infection and they've really been infected already for three or four weeks, uh, you know, FIBIG uh, two or three, then you're not going to get the same kind of result. That's great. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, another one there. Well, uh, nice talk. Uh, today, uh, earlier, Douglas Nixon showed some statistics showing that the majority of the babies, they don't get infected, uh, su suggesting that there may be some mechanisms that may prevent their infection during uh, in utero or birth or even pre uh, after birth uh, transmission. Uh, have you checked some of the 
once the child is studying these babies that they end up getting infected, do you notice something that may suggest why they are getting infected while there are many others that they don't get infected? Uh, that's a great question. So even in the era before we started using AZT to prevent mother-to-child transmission, only 15 to 30 percent of babies born of HIV-infected mothers actually acquired HIV. So you're right there, and, and I'm sure Doug went through this. And, and there are a variety of protective mechanisms, not, not all of which are, are well understood, but there have been correlates with uh, uh, various uh, levels of maternal immunity against the virus. And um, we, because we were really only looking for infected babies, we didn't have a, we don't really have the right controls to ask why uh, these babies became infected compared to all the uninfected babies. Um, and, and we don't have uh, uh, samples from the mothers that enable us to do any detailed immunological uh, analysis. Well, thank you. That was great discussion. Thank you. It's a pleasure.